Welcome. So we're sitting here today with Aaron Dupree. Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for taking time to speak with me. Absolutely. You know, we've talked about you on a couple past episodes, but I'm excited to have you here, really be able to, to talk about your side of the story and really share your perspective on, I'm sure, a, a busy couple of months. So when we interview people, we generally like to start by asking them sort of what brought them to cannabis in the first place. You've touched on in a couple past press conferences about how you found medicinal relief from cannabis, but sort of, if you don't mind catching us up, sort of what brought you to cannabis in the first place? Sure. So I was actually late to the game, um, according to a lot of people that I've worked with in the industry. I was a great D.A.R.E. graduate, um, so I actually didn't dabble in anything cannabis until I was in my 30s. Um, I'd actually been camping with friends, and I had been having a really bad spell. I'd been really sick, and one of my friends just said, just just, just do this with us. Like, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work, but like, just, just at least try it. And he finally wore me down. He'd asked me, like, I don't know, several times that weekend. So I did. And I, for the first time in a very long time, didn't have any pain. Um, I was in a much better mood. Um, and I actually could enjoy things that I hadn't been able to enjoy for a while. And that was the moment where I was like, wait a minute, there's something to this. And that actually sparked this in, in entirety to where I am today. I started doing a lot of research. I actually did a lot of studying. I went out to California and Colorado and really started to hone in on why is this working for me? Why is this helping me, right? I'm kind of a nerd. I wanted to know the specifics behind it. Um, and so that was really how that journey all began. It was because one friend on a camping trip saw that I was in agony and he knew something I didn't knew, didn't know. And he just really wanted to help me. I love that. We've talked to a lot of people that have been brought to cannabis sort of not by seeking out the recreational or adult use side of it, but sort of by having people in their lives or them themselves finding relief. So very cool to hear that that's a similar connection for you. So then go moving forward from that, you were doing the research, you were looking into sort of the, you know, we love the nerdy side of stuff. Of why is this helping me? Take us forward to you starting up Lunacy in July of 2022. Sort of what motivated you to not just go from the research side, but to actually begin sort of getting these products out to people? So lunacy had been sitting in the back of my mind for a while, right? The goal was like, well, if Minnesota ever gets around to legalizing, we would love to have a dispensary. Um, so when they kind of, you know, haphazardly passed hemp legislation in 2022, I, I looked around at my crew and I was like, do we start early? Do we head in? Do we do it? And we all kind of said, yeah, what a great ride. Let's try. Let's go for it. So um, what was kind of this background um, you know, business plan that I had had, we kind of accelerated forward and pivoted to the hemp derived portion of the um, cannabis industry. Um, and I thought, okay, this is what Minnesota is going to do. We're going to take these little stepping stones to get to legalization. And I wanted to be a part of it. Um, and so Lunacy, I was just like, let's do it. And when I started Lunacy, I actually committed to working the actual store because I was interested in talking to Minnesotans, not only about why they were coming um, in for hemp drive products, but like what were their thought processes all the way through? Similar to you, I wanted to know what brought them to cannabis. And I thought that the best research I could have would be those one-on-one -on -one conversations with people. Um, and it was just having Lunacy open in a physical location was great, but I always remind people that we started online. You know, we had the business, we decided in July that we were going to do it. In August, we went to several different shows and I went to a few different conferences to really learn about hemp drug products because most of my expertise was in marijuana. Um, and so I think our website went live in September and we were selling all across the nation. Um, when it became apparent that we had a pretty good following and people here in Minnesota were like, oh, we want to come to your store. We want to come see the products. I thought, let's open a physical location. And it was a challenge. It took months to be able to find a landlord that would work with us. Um, but it was quite a ride. Um, you know, I always remind, remind people the only reason that Lunacy's physical location doesn't exist today is because my store was in Apple Valley and Apple Valley instituted a moratorium. The moratorium is what closed my store. So I hear a lot of sort of, you know, rhymes to other people's stories that we've talked through before of, of really sort of having this passion finding the network of people that are interested in it, and then really sort of it all launching from there. So take us through what some of like the day-to-day -day operations were of you really getting started. So you mentioned you sort of went to some trade shows. Once you got that store up and running, what was it like actually working in the retail side? 
So the online store was actually really difficult because I'm sure a lot of people listening know it's very difficult to advertise anything cannabis related in social media or anywhere else. Um, so online was actually really difficult to get like a true following. Um, but once we opened the store, it was amazing to me how people would just pop in with questions. Um, it was really fun to have that interaction and it was great to be able to offer products that could really help people with ailments that they were having. Um, we had to do a major product overhaul, right? What we were selling online in lots of different states was incredibly different than what we could have in a physical location here in Minnesota. So we completely flopped our product line um, in like one month's time, <laughs> um, specifically for the Minnesota market. Um, and I just, you know, I always tell people, I, I miss it. I really do. Um, you know, we had just gotten to the point um, in July when the moratorium was instituted. I'd already actually hired other people to start working for me. Um, and it was just kind of sad that I was like, sorry, guys, <laughs> got to go in a different direction. So, yeah, we've definitely heard a lot of businesses that the moratoriums are, are really sort of a, a barrier to that success. It's we're seeing really this awesome move forward from the statewide level of we're moving towards legalization, but some of the municipalities not so much supportive. And Correct. sort of adding an additional roadblock in front of that, you've talked a little bit about having chronic pain, sort of having a condition that, that impacts your ability some days to, to do your job. Can you tell us a little bit about what having some of those additional barriers was like as a business owner? Yeah, so I'm lucky. Um, I have technically been in what would be considered remission for about seven years. Um, so even though I still end up with bad days, that happens on a quarterly basis instead of a monthly basis. Um, but I think overall, the hardest part is the fact that there is no um, there is no support system for you, right? Nobody is actively talking about this is what I'm doing. These are the challenges that I'm having. And so you really feel like you're kind of by yourself on an island. And that's the hardest part, right? That you, you think you're the only one that's struggling with it. Um, and so sometimes it was a nice reminder to me that people will come to me and say, hey, no, I'm doing this too. We're struggling with this too. Um, and so I've actually given advice to other people that if you're in that position, um, reach out to your group of people and find somebody who can help you get more spoons. Hmm. I love that. And the analogy of the spoons and running out of them by the end of the day, I think is just such a perfect analogy of what it's like to sort of go through life with chronic pain. And it, it's just additional barriers. So I appreciate you touching on that a little bit. So you've talked about finding products that you yourself found relief from or finding just beneficial to your own life. Can you tell us a little bit about how you decided like what products went into your store? We've talked to a lot of brands that are wanting to like get their products into different storefronts throughout Minnesota. And from the retailer side, like, is it helpful when brands are just cold calling you or through what's the best way to really get in touch with business owners? So, you know, when you have a store, you are kind of inundated by people who are emailing you, cold calling your store, people that are just stopping in. But the mode that I felt to be most helpful is when vendors will call in advance and say, hey, I'm going to be in your area, you know, on Tuesday between two and five. Is it cool if I stop by and show you some stuff? Those are the most helpful for me because then I could make sure that I had somebody else at the store with me. So if we were busy, I wasn't actually walking away from clients to deal with a vendor. Um, and it was great because that one-on-one -on -one interaction, I could ask questions. I could actually see the physical packaging and see the product. Um, and that's really helpful. I also really liked it when they did a follow-up like, hey, we came out, we dropped off these samples, we talked about this. When can we loop back around? Um, I found that to be most helpful because you're inundated with cold calls and cold emails. To be honest, I almost never responded to them because I just didn't have time for it. Um, so that physical being in front of me at the store was the best way to get my business. That definitely makes sense. And I can see how, you know, getting 30 emails a day from brands wanting you to carry your products isn't super helpful. But having someone come in and say, let me show you what I have. This is why it's something you should carry is really that additional next step. So I'd love for to sort of give you an opportunity to address some allegations that have been floating around. We've been sort of talking about some of the products in your stores. There was some reports by the Star Tribune in the hours after you were appointed director that sort of claimed that you were selling non-compliant products. Um, I know that a lot of those articles were published without your comment. So sort of what do you what do you want to say about that? So the hard part about that is that um, even though the state was telling those reporters contact Aaron, the state was telling me, Aaron, sit tight, don't say anything, we're handling it. So that part is really hard for me to address because had I been able to have conversations with the people at the Star Tribune, I think that article would have looked a lot differently. I think a lot of people assume that being compliant is black and white, and it is not. It never has been. 
And that's part of what kind of inched me down to the path of where I am today is that it is difficult. And I had other business owners like asking me, who are you getting help from for compliance and how are you doing this? And the one thing I tell people is that because Lunacy was a new business, we were under high scrutiny from all of the financial institutions that we did business with. So I was getting audited by my credit card processor and my bank every 30 to 45 days. We would have to send pictures of what was physically in the store. They would audit our website. And sometimes they would take stuff and be like, what is this? Uh, what, what, what's in the COA? We don't understand this. And there were products sometimes that they would be like, this one's too risky for us. So even though technically under law, they would be like, yes, it's legal, but this is too risky. So we need to let go of it. So I was actually being held accountable and compliant way more by the financial institutions I was doing business with than like with the state. Because they're like, there's a hotline. You can't just call somebody and say, hey, this vendor's trying to sell me this product. Is this actually compliant in our state? They totally put the onus on business owners to be able to define that. Um, so the difficult part about that is the video that he posted where I'm talking about this vape. That was in February of this year. But they were pinning it as if I had just done that. Um, and that isn't the case. We don't carry that product in our store anymore because, as we all know, that's not really what the law wants us to be carrying. So we don't. Um, so I felt like that was just a little disingenuous on Star Tribune's point of how they presented that. Um, and I just keep telling people, if compliance was easy, we wouldn't be having this conversation. Hmm. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. And one thing that you've touched on in, in some past comments about this is just sort of around the lack of clarity and, and just like any sort of regulation, um, not only in the beginning part of this year, but going back to like, when lunacy really first began in July of last year, like sort of what does a compliant product look like? There wasn't advice from the state of Minnesota on what that was. There was perhaps some regulations that were written in statute, but sort of the interpretation of that was left pretty open. Can you describe a little bit about what it was like as a business owner to like not really have clear guidance from the state and try to figure out yourself what, what does compliance look like? It was difficult, right? You're pulling on information from not only what you've gathered, but what other professionals in the industry. You know, we talk to lawyers, we talk to compliance people, we, our financial institutions were keeping us compliant. It was a constant conversation that we were having. And I put so many business resources into maintaining a compliant level. Um, and I often think about the fact that I'm a seasoned business owner, right? So a lot of um, how to solve the problem of staying compliant was easy because I knew what resources to pull on. Um, I feel for smaller businesses that don't have that experience and don't have those resources because they really are just, they really don't know. They're making their best effort based on the information they have. And the information is convoluted, right? They passed a law in July of 2022. And if we back that or bring that forward all the way to today, there's like a dozen different regulations, memos that they put out that made it even more confusing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, one recent thing that's come out of the Department of Health is saying that products can't have like scoops to measure out what a serving is. It has to be physically scored or marked on the product because the statute says scored or marked on the product. But when we look at like how servings are done in basically any other product outside of cannabis, that's a serving and that's accepted. Department of Health is now saying no. But I guess we'll see if the regulations change. I mean, it's, it's definitely a a pretty confusing time. You talked a little bit in past interviews about how this was actually one of your motivators to decide to throw your hat into the race in the first place, to really want to become that director to help improve the communication around compliance. Can you talk a little bit about what you think the state needs to be doing um, moving forward into the next chapter to ensure that business owners sort of know what compliance looks like? I think that they need to actually start making compliance rules that are in line with what other legal states have done so that it's easy and it's somewhat the, I don't want to say the same across legal states, but kind of like you just spoke about how, you know, how they break up a serving is non-traditional from how you would typically do that in the cannabis industry. And I think that that just leaves room for more confusion. Um, that was one of the things that I really wanted to tackle was not just kind of revising where are we at with hemp and how do we make this more simple, but how do we move forward in the marijuana space without making it convoluted? How do we make sure that the policies and the rulemaking that we do is concise and easy for businesses to understand? You know, like I've said, this isn't reinventing the wheel here. 
you know, we can look back on the other 22 states that legalized and say, this is what worked and this is what didn't work and kind of pick and choose what we want to do. But for whatever reason, Minnesota has been trying to reinvent the wheel in the hemp derived market. And I just don't think that's healthy for the market or for consumers or business owners. Yeah, that's totally fair. And I appreciate you sharing your perspective as a business owner. You know, we at the Minnesota Cannabis College from the outside looking in can say like, hey, this isn't super clear, try to provide some guidance. But as a business owner, it, it's interesting hearing your same perspective as there's really not a ton of clarity around it. So sort of moving and on. there's a- not a ton of clarity for, for consumers either, not to interrupt you, but like no, not at all. as a business owner, it's confusing. As a consumer who knows way less about the product than I do, it's even more confusing for them, mm-hmm. which is hard because we're trying to guide consumers through this market that's confusing in terms that they typically aren't used to hearing or they don't understand. So, so much about having a storefront and being able to interact with people was education because it's confusing for everybody who's coming mm-hmm. to the table, not just the business owners. Mm-hmm. No, and I think that's such a, a valid point. We were at an event the other day and there were people asking us questions about like, so if I go to another state, what products can I bring with me? Like, how do I know what's legal to bring on an airplane? And it's like, well, you sort of have to look at the label, but also sometimes the label won't be correct. And it's also sort of up to TSA, but also it's not because it's cannabis. So it's allowed to be flown, but it's confusing. So moving forward a bit from, from running your business, what was it like as a business owner watching House File 100 really move through the legislative process? Um, you know, we were reporting along with it, sometimes in the Senate chambers at 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, But as a business owner, what was it like watching that move through? It was exciting and terrifying at all the same time, (laughs) especially because, you know, we didn't know what direction the final bill was going to go. We didn't know exactly what was going to be in there. Um, So I will admit that I was watching it, but I was trying not to watch it too closely because it was also creating some undue anxiety. (laughs) And I thought, you know what, following this before we get to the end is just going to be too much for me. So I was kind of watching from afar, from a wallflower. You know, I wasn't part of any advocacy groups. I I unfortunately wasn't a huge part of pushing um, this legislation forward, Um, but I definitely was biting my nails like what's going to be in the in the final bill and the final law like how is this going to go um so it was a bit of a roller coaster ride for sure definitely fair no and i, I appreciate you sharing about that um it's i think with a roller coaster ride for for a lot of people no matter what side of the the perspective you were looking at in the bill uh, definitely a lot of ups and downs so let's move forward a little bit so the bill passes the process sort of starts to begin for them hiring the director of the office of cannabis management That window closed July of this year. So tell us a little bit about sort of what motivated you to apply, what what it was like when you were submitting that application. Sure. So if I remember correctly, they actually opened the job posting in July, and I think it closed at the end of July, maybe the 28th, the 29th, something Mm -hmm. like that. Um, And I actually hadn't considered applying for the job, but I had had uh, three different business associates reach out to me within a 24 hour period with a link to the job posting. Like, I think you should apply for this. We need somebody like you in this role. And I was like, me, I'm, I'm an entrepreneur. Like, I don't know anything about you know, working for the state, I haven't had a boss in 20 plus years. But when I read through the job posting, I thought, wait, I actually have the qualifications and the experience for this. I'm going to go ahead and throw my hat in the ring. You know, my grandfather, who um, participated in government, always said to us and the family, like, you come out of the private sector to serve your community and to serve your state with the knowledge and experience that you have. And then you go back to um, the private sector. And that's really where I was at. I viewed um, putting my hat in as my way to serve the community that I've done business in for 20 plus years. I didn't really view it as a traditional job. I really viewed it as something that I could do to serve my community and serve my state. Um, and I thought that I was in a really unique position in life that I could do that. Um, when the application went live, I had just gotten notice that the moratorium was going to be happening in Apple Valley. Um, And so I was like, well, this is a unique pairing of life, right? Like they always say, when one door closes, another door opens. So that was kind of like, I kind of thought of it like, okay, you know, three different people without solicitation recommended I do this. Um, So I really looked at it seriously and thought to myself, well, this could be my opportunity to give back to the community. So that's exactly what I tried to do. That makes sense. There definitely were a lot of sort of factors in the universe hinting you in that direction. Very neat. Yeah. So I want to focus actually in on your grandfather for a second, if I totally can. So um, we looked back at the legislative history and your grandfather was a state representative 
the year that Minnesota actually voted the first time, 1935, to prohibit cannabis. And he was one of the, along with 101 other legislators, the, the pro vote, so voting in favor of that measure, voting to prohibit cannabis in Minnesota. You know, we shared this fact and we got some, I'll say some gentle criticism online of people saying like, why are you celebrating this? And it's like, no, 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 you're totally focusing on the wrong thing. This is history come for full circle and really us in just a few generations going from prohibiting to now like selling and regulating. What tell me a little bit about like, did you know that as you were applying sort of a little bit more about that? So actually, you talked about it. Um, I actually really thought that I had this opportunity to really move forward, right, to show progress, not just in my own family and our thought processes, but really just where Minnesotans are at, right? And I've, I felt empowered by that because my grandfather did make that vote and with the, probably with the, the best way he knew how with the information he had at the time. And now we have more information, right? And when you know more, you do better. And that was really one of the things that motivated. Um, it wasn't something that I actually knew when I sent in my application, um, but it was something that one of my family members brought to my attention. And I was like, that's really cool. This is even, this is, this was another one of those little things in life that happened, you know, that I was like, oh, the stars are aligning. This all makes sense now. Very cool. Yeah, it's one of those neat through lines of history. Like we definitely see sort of people from a legislative background and then should kids or grandchildren wanting to be in government, but that direct connection of being in office for really a pretty short amount of time, just about one session, being that session that prohibits cannabis all the way forward to today, I just think is so neat. So that's really cool. It is. So take us forward a little bit. So we, we talked about you throwing your hat into the ring. What was that application process actually like? We've heard in media reports, but all media reports are just sort of outside looking in of like applications and background checks and all of that fun. What was it like actually being the person going through it? So it was actually really intense and it maybe just felt that way because I haven't done job interviews in decades, <laughs> you know, so maybe to somebody else, the process was normal, but to me, it was like totally different. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we, every time that we did an interview, it wasn't just with one person, you're doing it with a panel. Um, one of the interviews, uh, one of the interview preps was they actually wanted us to devise a plan for applications and licensing and what pitfalls we may find. Um, and I actually spent like 45 hours on that plan because I'm the person that if I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it. I treated it like they were a consulting client and I did all my, my research. I, you know, I'm, I have a little bit of a tech background. So I, I built this really great storyboard and everything in Figma and like, I had done a really great presentation in Canva, but essentially the plan that I had, I could actually back up with data and with technology because I knew it had worked in other legal states. Mm -hmm. um, and so there was a lot of prep put into that. But I also have been telling people this was kind of a two prong approach, right? So they were interviewing you just like they would for any other traditional job setting, I imagine. But then they were also, once you got to a certain point, we're doing a background investigation, right? So it, it was it was twofold. There were days where I was doing interviews and interview prep, and then there were days where I'm filling out what seemed like chapters of paperwork and doing interviews for my background investigation. So in my mind, I don't have anything to compare it to because I haven't applied for a job, like I said, in a long time. Um, but it did feel like uh, it was a well thought out process. It definitely sounds thorough, if, if nothing else, of of, you know, the window really closing that end of July and it being about two months before they really sort of picking the name. So definitely a lot of, a lot of work went into it. Um, take us forward now to the actual day of the announcement. So we saw the press conference in the morning, but that was a pretty limited period of your day. What was sort of day zero of being an agency head like? Well, it actually started the day before um, because there was some prep work that had to go into that press conference. Mm -hmm. um, and so I had worked on Wednesday and I'd done some media training um, and we had had some conversations about what the following day would look like. Um, the actual day I was excited, right? This, to me, this was an opportunity um, to, to do something great. And so I was in a great mood. I was excited, but it was a busy day. Um, after the press conference, I had dozens of phone calls that I needed to make to people that had helped push the bill forward and through to introduce myself and to thank them for the work that they had done. Um, so it was it was a long day, but um, until later that afternoon, it had been a great day. Mm -hmm. Fair. 
Well, you definitely at the press conference, I mean, we're saying the right things. It's one of the things we talked about in this podcast, really putting that emphasis on providing access to people, really being not only the support of businesses, but also the protector of consumers. And I just, I really appreciate you raising a lot of those points. So you hinted at sort of the morning of the day being a little bit different than the afternoon. Take us through a little bit about that change and sort of um, a little bit more about what that afternoon was like. Yeah, so later that evening, um, I'd actually gotten some communication from them that the Star Tribune, that somebody they actually didn't tell me at that time, that somebody had had information that products I was carrying were non-compliant. And I was like, what are you talking about? Um, it didn't become clear until the next day what was actually going on. Um, and that's the point where I, in the moment, I didn't think to ask this, but I should have asked who said the product was non-compliant because I don't actually know where they were getting their information from. It's hard for me to believe that some reporter at the Star Tribune took a look at one video and went, that's not compliant. Like, it doesn't make sense. Um, but I didn't ask that question because I was uh, kind of in shock, really. And also, I thought that they were going to support me. Um, and when they didn't, that's really when things started to go south quickly. And that happened on, you know, Friday midday. Um, and I was surprised, right, because my gut instinct was to talk to the reporters. I was getting phone calls, emails. I had people coming to my house. Um, but I was also getting directive from them that, nope, sit tight. We're handling it. Um, and so what should have been a normal Friday actually turned out to be an extremely stressful day. Um, and some of the red flags that I had gotten through the process, um, by the time Friday evening came around, I had finally just said, you know what, this is enough. Um, if this is how this is going to go, I don't want to be a part of this. And so I, I put in my withdrawal. That definitely makes sense. And one thing that you've touched on in some other statements is, you know, there were people that were sort of continuously reaching out to you. There were people that were following you. Definitely an, an overwhelming experience, I can imagine. So I'm sorry to hear you went through that. Yeah, it was overwhelming and I felt really unprepared for it. Um, and I don't think that the governor's office was ready for what happened. I don't think they could have prepared me for that. I don't think anybody was prepared for what happened. Totally. So you've stated that there wasn't really much support in terms of the governor's side. They sort of sending reporters to you, but then also at the same time telling you, please don't reach out to the reporters. Can you take us through sort of the, the final moments before you decided this is this is what I'm done with? Yeah, so... Um, in true fashion, I called my lawyer and I said, listen, I, this is where I'm at. This is what's been said. And we had a long conversation about what these actions on Friday would mean going forward. And ultimately, I decided that I just couldn't move forward with this. I don't think that they were prepared for the amount of scrutiny that that office was going to have, um, which is hard for me to say out loud because I knew that was coming and I had actually expressed to them, hey, I'll fight for this. Like, let me talk to these reporters. Um, I can refute a lot of what's being said here. I have documentation. I have all these things that I can, I can talk about. And they just kept saying, no, no, we're not going to go that route, you know. So after speaking with my lawyer, it became pretty clear that if this was the way that things were going to go, it isn't how I do business. And I didn't want to be represented that way. There were things that happened on Thursday and things that happened on Friday that if I was running the boat, that is not the way things would have gone. And because I'm used to steering the ship, it was very hard for me to sit back and let somebody else make the decisions. And ultimately, I think, I don't think, I know that's what spurred me to withdraw because I just, I couldn't be a part of something that one, wasn't supporting me, and two, wasn't letting me actually be a part of the process that was affecting my life. Well, I appreciate you explaining that. I think, you know, the articles that were written about it included maybe like a sentence or two blurb from the statement that you put out. And that was sort of the extent of your perspective on it that people were sharing. So I really appreciate you being willing to come on. Tell us a little bit more about what it was actually like, you know, being the person behind that role, not just the director, but really the director, Aaron. So thank you for sharing that. The governor has said that they've started begun work on figuring out sort of who that next appointment is. You're the only person that has experience sort of being in that role, having been named that that position. Um, what advice do you have for the governor's next election? You know, I think it's going to be really hard for them to choose anybody who's from Minnesota because now everybody knows what happens. Everybody knows the scrutiny that comes with that appointment. I think they're going to inevitably have to choose somebody from outside of the state, um, probably somebody from with a compliance background. Um, and I would just say, come ready, come ready for the fight because it sits here. The cannabis community is very um, 
set on who or what entity should have that role. And if you don't fit the little box that they want you to be in, they're gonna come with a fight. So I would advise them to do your research and to come ready. Fair. Well, I appreciate you sharing that advice. As we wrap up our interview today, you know, we've covered a lot. We've talked about your experience as a business owner. We've talked about your experience sort of going through this whole fun of, of the state. Um, tell us a little bit more about what comes next for you. Do you have hopes of staying in the cannabis industry or sort of what, what comes next for Aaron Dupree? Yeah, so I had to dissolve and sell businesses to take this appointment. Um, so that's been a change for me. Um, so I'm really trying to take just a step back after all of this. I'll probably take some time off before I decide what direction I go next. But I can definitely say that um, I wish I could find a way to still help the Minnesota cannabis community move this forward. Um, I don't know what that looks like. Um, you know, I've been a small business consultant and a business consultant for many years. Um, and I've gone back and forth about whether or not I want to provide my expertise going forward. So I don't know. Check back with me in 45 days and I'll let you know. Totally fair. Well, I appreciate you coming on today and talking about your experience. I think you've really done a, a big service in helping people to understand like the importance of the state providing clear rules around compliance. It's business owners are not out there trying to run astray of the rule. I mean, there are certainly some, but not not everyone. They're they're out there trying to make sure that they're following the rules and they just need that support on the state side of telling them, telling them what they are. So I hope that the next chapter of legalization, the next chapter of low potency edibles, the next chapter of medical, whatever be it, that they include some pretty clear regulations and help business owners to follow through on those. I hope so too. Well, Aaron, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. Thank you so much for, for stepping aside and, and just being willing to, to tell us a little bit more about the experiences that you've been through as a business owner, as the name director and, and everything else. So um, thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you.